So how do we get from the RNL cell that we know already to the LSTM? So the um, structure of the RNA, classical RNN cell was the following. So we have XT and we have YT, that's the output. And then we have the state vector H uh, that passes on information from previous time steps to the current and to the future time steps. And that was kind of the uh, memory of the of the RNN. And the idea was that we add now a second strain, which also is a, is a memory. And we want to call the second strain in CT. But let's take a look at the RNN. So we multiply XT with a learnable WX. And we do so with the um, um, state vector HT. Um, we multiply it with a learnable WH. And then we add the bias. We pass it on to tangent hyperbolicus. And it creates HT, which we want to pass on to the next and the cell in the next time step. And if we multiply HT with another learnable WY, uh, that's the output uh, YT. So, however, now we have a second string. And now we have to combine um, H and C, and somehow they have to communicate with each other. And one idea of was to add information from H to C and do this in a particular way. So let's continue um, as we, or with a structure that we know from the RNN. So we have XT and multiply this with um, a learnable and we want to call this U sub F and I want to show you in a few seconds why we use the index F. Um, also we want to multiply HT with a learnable WF and of course, we also want to add a bias. And then we want to add this information to C. And how are, uh, going, um, how are we going to do that? So we uh, pass this information on to a sigmoid. And then we multiply the result element-wise to the vector CT. So HT is a vector. CT is also a state vector. And if we multiply them element-wise, they, of course, must have the same shape. And what actually happens if we if we do that? So for example, if it turns out then due to the learnables WF, UF, and BF, that for some states we get the value zero and we multiply this with CT element wise, those values will be set to zero. So and if if that happens, then that means that we forget input from the previous time steps. If we multiply this with zero, those values are deleted. So whatever happened before in the previous time steps, if we multiply this with zero, um, those values will be zero. And if we also do this for the next time steps all the time, um, it will be zero throughout um, the time. So that's the reason why this part is called forget gate. And that's why we use the term FT and the indices uh, F for W, U, and B. So that's the forget gate. But for the same reason, you can actually um, also call it a um, memory or remember gate, because if this value is one, then we keep the information. But commonly, it's uh, called forget gate. So we multiply uh, these values element-wise. And if there's one value, which is 0, then it uh, deletes, so to say, the information from the previous time set of CT. And that's the reason why it's called forget gate. So that's the equation. So we again have uh, our learnables. We multiply UF with XT, WF with HT from the previous time step. So it's T minus one. We add a bias and then we pass it on to the sigmoid. And that is the value um, for our forget gate. So however, the problem is if we multiply this with zero at one particular time step, it will be zero all the time. So no matter uh, what value we're going to multiply this in the next time steps. Um, and that's actually a problem because it might be something that we have forgotten uh, is might be important in the next time step. So we somehow have to have another gate that gives us the possibility to correct this decision. And the easiest way is to uh, get um, 
another gate where we just pass on the information and just add this. So we kind of, kind of resetting uh, the value. And um, we want to do this with intangents hyperbolicus for, um, uh, for compactification. But that would be too simple because we still want to learn when are we going to do that. And the idea is that we um, add another part with a sigmoid and that we multiply the output of, from the sigmoid with the output from the tension, so they kind of communicate. And we do this element-wise because then we decide which part should give an input to our CT, and then we can reset this if we add the resulting value. And since that's an input that we can add, it's called IT or input gate. And also here, um, we add learnables. So also here, again, we multiply XT with a vector or matrix UI. Uh, we do the same with H T minus one. So we multiply this with a learnable WI and we also add a bias BI. So this part here um, also contains learnable. So we the network is going to learn which information it passes on through the input gate. And then we do the same for the gate, which is denoted as C tilde here. Uh, it's again the same structure, uh, but now we have the tangents hyperbolicus. Um, I just want to say that um, there's not the particular structure of an LSTM, so there are different LSTM structures, and they also might vary in this detail. So it also you also might see, for example, a structure where this tangents hyperbolicus is, for example, um, another activation function, sigmoid or something, or also other structures and gates uh, might be a bit different. So there are different versions of an LSTM, but the overall idea is always the same so that we have these, let's say, two competing gates, the forget gate and the input gate. Uh, but then um, we still, of course, want to get an output CT in HT. So for example, if we look at HT, uh, it does not change at all. So we just pass it on, even though we have uh, some learnables here, learnables here, learnables here, but they do not really influence HT. So what we're going to do now is that we um, add um, another part. So first of all, we add a sigmoid again, which contains learnables. And then we also link the CT to our HT, because remember, um, we modified CT already. We pass it on to the cell in the next time state, but we also have to pass on HT. And if we look at this train here without those changes, um, it just passes on the same value. So now we want to combine it with CT um, so that we also change HT, of course. And therefore, we um, create a so-called output gate, which is this part here. And then we multiply the result of the output gate uh, again, element wise with what we get from CT. So it's the same idea so that we have an influence of HT to CT. We can reset this influence and we also have an influence from CT to HT. So that's the overall idea. And also, of course, we want to um, learn um, what the output's going to be. And that's why the output gate has these learnables here um, and again has the same structure. And also here, you might see LSTMs with slightly different structures. So finally, um, when we have the output gate, as I said, we multiply this element-wise with what we get from CT, and we have the tangents hyperbolicus in between for uh, um, compactification. So that's not learnable here. So therefore, let me just highlight all these equations. So this is the uh, set of equations where we have all our learnables. And I also want to highlight this in those boxes here. So that's why um, it's filled with these uh, blue, with the blue color here to indicate that we really have learnables, whereas the tangents hyperbolicus here does not have actual learnables. Um, it's just for rescaling those values. Okay, so then therefore the overall um, equations are like this. So we have to learnables here, and then we combine these different gates. And now let's take a look at the shapes of these matrices. Um, because of 
um, everything, so like the shapes and the sizes of the matrices and vectors have to make sense and have to add up. So, and let's start with something simple. So we have our input XT, which is just a one times one matrix. Um, if we keep it simple and have just a one feature uh, LSTM. And then as for our RNN, we can say, okay, the learnable UF is just a vector n times one and n refers to the number of states then. Um, if we do that, of course, it has to maintain the same shape through all these operations you have here um, in the particular, uh, in the brackets here. So therefore BF, so the bias also must have the same structure because otherwise you can't add up these vectors. And then we pass it on to a sigmoid function, which does not change the structure or the shapes of the vectors. Uh, so therefore the output of the forget gate FT also must have the same structure. And if we also multiply this element wise uh, with CT and also HT, um, then also HT must have the same structure. Otherwise it doesn't make sense. And therefore, what is WF? Well, WF then must be an N times N matrix because if we multiply this with HT minus one, it returns an N times one vector again. And then everything has the correct shape and everything makes sense. And for all the other gates, uh, it's the same structure. If you look at the equations, so um, we just maintain the same structure, therefore, throughout the uh, LSTM cell. So same for the input gate, the output gate, and for what we call C tilde. So therefore, we're actually done with our LSTM. So we have all these different gates here and how the different strains H and C communicate with each other. But there's actually one more thing which is different now. So remember for the, uh, in the case of the RNN, we had HT and we multiplied it with the learnable WY uh, in order to create an output uh, YT, which then uh, also was the prediction for the values in the future. For an LSTM, that's actually not the case. So the output of the cell is just the state vector HT itself. Um, but somehow we still have to transfer it or um, yeah, have to map it uh, into our prediction yt. And how does it work? So the idea is that we calculate ht for all the different time steps. And then we have all the values for the vector ht for all different times. And then we add a dense layer after that. And in the dense layer, uh, we can convert those values from the state vector HT into the actual output YT. And this is the output then we can, uh, which is the predictions, that's what we can uh, compare to the actual training data YT and where we can calculate the loss function. So our cell, uh, unlike the classical RNN cell, does not uh, create yt as an output directly. It creates ht as an output, the state vector, but we uh, convert this output uh, with a dense layer into yt, and then we can compare our prediction uh, to the actual value if we perform the, the training. So that's one thing we also want to add. And also in the previous courses, we have used the dense layer already, uh, and we will just copy and paste the dense layer, and we can directly just add this to our LSTM. Uh, if you don't have the dense layer from the previous lectures, uh, you can just go to the GitHub repository and just copy and paste it. So there's a class dense layer and will automatically fit to our LSTM. So we will add this dense layer then later when once we have our cell. So that's a um, kind of, um, yeah, not fundamental difference, but a slight difference. So then we have um, our LSTM cell. And now we're ready for setting up the code and creating our LSTM. And therefore, uh, let's now move to the um, to our user interface or to our uh, part 
where we want to write down the codes, which is in my case, um, spider. And what we want to do at the end, so what the aim of the lecture is, is that we take um, a data set like this, for example, where we have, let's say, a short-term periodic behavior, where we also add some random noise, uh, so to challenge the network a bit, and where we also have a gradual change, a long-term change. And we want to see how the LSTM deals with that compared to the RNN. And we will see then at the end of the lecture that the LSTM is a lot better in predicting also the long-term change than the, R the classical RNN. And we are going to do this then in the next chapter. So I want to finish here. Um, and then I want to uh, set up the code um, in the next chapter.